<laughs> okay, we're live. Dan. Dan, Dan is here. He's just going to get. Can I say what he's going to get? He's going to get his ring light. And Adam, I've got to take credit for that because I think I was the one who introduced Dan to the ring light, which was revolutionary for him. Revolutionary for everyone. But anyway, welcome yeah, to the Saratoga okay. podcast. It's Wednesday, May 3rd, and we have got a packed show. There he is, Dan D. Federici. He's back, Dan the man. Hello. Hello. You guys are you guys... so much to talk about today, you guys, because. Okay, I know this is almost like a running joke because I say this every episode, but I think we can all agree, and the people I've talked to in the last 12 hours agree, last night actually takes the cake for the worst slash most chaotic city council meeting of this administration to date, hands down, without fail. Would you agree, yes or no? Until the one later this month, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but like to date, it was the worst. Would you agree? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it was. You know, we're we're we're, we're chuckling about it. Um, and Adam, I, I'm just going to say something briefly because I watched some of it online. You two were there. Um, I let me tell you something, and this is not unusual for that. I was doing a couple of things with my daughters, had it on the phone. There were so many f bombs. I had to shut the sound down because I've got a five and a nine year old. And then at one point, I, I just I, I got disgusted knowing we were going to be doing this today. And I want but I, you know, I, I couldn't be with my daughters and and this I just shut it off, focus on my daughters. But um, the uh, you know, if you can't watch a city hall meeting with your daughters there because there's so many F-bombs, that's, that's you I guess that's a given these able, days. You haven't been able to do that in, in about three years, Dan. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> But yeah. um, I just want to, because there is so much to talk about, I just kind of want to dive in and kind of set the scene for, for how this kind of played out yesterday and, and, and what led up to it. Because I knew, I had heard from multiple people yesterday going into this city council meeting that Saratoga BLM had met with Skidmore and they had a plan to go to public comment and they really wanted to dominate public comment and talk about the first item on the mayor's agenda, which talked about a restorative, resol a restorative justice resolution. However, within the language of that agenda item, uh, there was a sentence that uh, talked about apologizing for uh, a history of racism, promoting racism, and I, I should have pulled up. I should have pulled up the agenda item, and I don't know if you guys have it in front of you, but it was a very um, aggressive statement about apologizing for a history of promoting uh, racism and intolerance in the city of Saratoga Springs. Um, you know. And I'll, I'll pull it up and read it as we continue this conversation. And it was in the context, though, of passing a resolution that would establish a restorative justice committee. And so that was what primarily was prompting Saratoga BLM to come out because they really wanted this resolution to be passed. And so they were going to come. They were going to dominate pub the public comment period. And then what I was being told was that their plan was to commit an act of civil disobedience. And that they would, they were really trying to solicit um, Jim Montanino to uh, take action and to potentially, you know, arrest people. And uh, on the flip side, what I was hearing was that Jim Montanino was planning on really doubling down on being kind of the law and order city council member and and not putting up with chaos and not putting up with dis disruption and really, you know, arresting people if they disrupted the business of the city council, but also that he was really focused on arresting white people to show that he wasn't targeting black people. He wasn't targeting people in Saratoga BLM. Again, this is well, what wait, I was wait, are, are, Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, these were the allegations this is what I was being hearing. Hearing leading up to the meeting. Um, so I went to the meeting and sure enough, um, this is how it played out. Uh, public comment started. Although before public comment started, the city council passed the consent agenda. And that is not the normal order of operations for the city council. The consent agenda always comes after public comment. And the consent agenda is a vitally important part of the city council meeting because that's the part of the agenda where all the payroll transfers happen. That's where everyone gets paid. And if you don't pass the consent agenda, like literally no one gets paid that week. And so it's a really vitally important part of the city council agenda and getting the city business done and getting people paid for the week. And so I thought it was kind of odd that they did that before public comment. And I'll, I'll kind of circle back to that in, in a moment. Um, at the very outset of the public comment period as well, Mayor Kim acknowledged 
that he had heard that there was going to be some disruption planned at the meeting. And he warned people that other members of the city council uh, had planned to um, uh, take some punitive action towards people who were going to disrupt uh, the proceedings of the council. And he did not condone um, other city council members taking any action like that, but uh, that that was uh, potentially intended. So it was kind of like a weird warning to put out, but it was clear to me that the city council had also heard the same things I heard, and they were kind of prepped for some potential disruption slash civil disobedience. So for approximately almost two hours, um, there was uh, public comment after public comment after public comment, really from uh, BLM and BLM supporters, um, much of the same of what we heard over the last couple months, really chastising Jim, calling him names, calling him racist, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the same messages we've heard um, before. And then uh, they went on to vote on this agenda item that was uh, the restorative justice agenda item. And the discussion about the agenda item got kind of heated. Um, Jim Montanino was the lone dissenter on this item, and he really wasn't allowed to discuss it and get his point across. He was kind of uh, cut off and silenced by the mayor. Um, and then they voted on it. It passed four to one, um, with, again, Commissioner Montanino being the one um, uh, person who voted uh, against this item. And as soon as uh, the agenda item was passed, I will play a video of uh, what happened. So this is what happened as soon as the item was passed. My third item. I'm gonna ask. Mr. Mayor, I see that your resolution, the resolution that the council just passed, that the first step to true reconciliation and restorative justice is to acknowledge, apologize, and review this past. And we do that as a city council today. So when do we start reviewing the past, Mr. Mayor? You're going to sit there? You're going to challenge me, Ron? You're going to stand there and puff out your chest? You're going to do anything, Mr. Mayor? You're going to restore order or you're going to sit there? You should hang your head in shame. So can, can, can I ask was, you to say, what were they chanting and what was the response? I, I couldn't make out the words. So, so basically what they were chanting was drop the charges. So their protest was directed at Jim and they want him to drop the charges against Chandler Hickenbottom and Els Guerrero, uh, which were the summonses that he brought against them for the previous meetings um, for dis disrupting uh, city business, obstructing, obstructing city business. So the protest was directed towards Jim. And what Ron Kim, the exchange between Ron and Jim uh, was quite dramatic because uh, what Jim was saying was, Mr. Mayor, are you going to do anything? Are you going to try to bring control to this meeting? And what Ron did, which I actually for a moment really thought that Mayor Kim was going to stand up and, and, and honestly punch Jim in the face. Mayor Kim jumped out of the seat and started saying, are you going to arrest them? Are you going to arrest them? And was running over to where Jim was sitting to co physically confront him. And then at the last moment stopped and turned around and went back to his seat. And it was, so, it was nothing like I've ever seen. And so um, this went on for a mo a two or three or four minutes. And then the city council, they all just stood, you know, they all just sat there, they were doing nothing. And then they announced, Mayor Kim announced that he was going to take a recess until 9.30. They exited the room for about two or three minutes, I want to say. They came back into the room. You couldn't hear much. The protest was still actively going on very loudly. 
The protesters at one point started singing, hit the road, Jim, and don't you come back no more, no more. I mean, it was like a very organized, like they had signs. It was, they had their chants, they had their songs. And it was, again, all directed at Jim. And when they came back from this very short recess, all you could really hear was someone say, do I have a second? And then you couldn't really hear anything else. And then the city council members started to disperse again. I texted one of the city council members and I said, is uh, is the meeting over? Is the, Has the meeting adjourned? And I got a confirmation that yes, the meeting had indeed been canceled. And so essentially what happened was that they were able to get through the first agenda item. There were 45 agenda items on the meeting last night, 45. They were able to get through one, the protest broke out and they canceled the remainder of the meeting. The protesters continued to protest for another probably 25 minutes. So the council members left. Um, Mayor Kim stayed there. He kind of stayed at the table. He kind of like stayed there with his arms crossed and just kind of watched them for a while. Um, and finally, after about 20 or 25 minutes, um, they dispersed and and went home. Um, but it was uh, it, it was chaotic. And and I just have to say that this is the second time in a matter of you know two or three months that the council has not been able to take control of the room and actually get through the business of the city and has had to cancel the entire meeting. And this is the second time in the history of the city of Saratoga Springs that this has happened. This has never happened before, but it's now happened twice under this administration. And so, you know, later in this discussion, to me, it really begs the question, is the city council capable of leading a meeting? And how, how do we continue down this path? I mean, I truly don't think they're capable of controlling the room anymore. Um, but there were also a few other disturbing things that happened in public comment and, and another video that I kind of wanted to play because I think there's a line that sometimes gets crossed with some of these public comments. And in one case, um, there was a woman from Skidmore who was speaking. And one of the things she said to Commissioner Montanino, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, guys, um, I, I found to be a bit disturbing. Um, and I, and I want to play it real quick for you. President and founder of the first BSU. My name is Yami Majiabe, and I'm not just a student at Skimmer, but I'm also the president and founder of the first BSU, not just at the school, but in this racist ass town. Okay. There is some I didn't originally plan on speaking tonight, but I'll let the words of my predecessor speak for me. Pass the restorative bill tonight and pass the rest of the 50 points. I will also say to you, John, Jim, whatever your name is, I know you're afraid of black people, I know you're afraid of black women, but I'm standing here as a black woman telling you, you should be afraid of me. Because I'm gonna continue to get educated and get ready to take people like you out of this world. Take that how you will, take that, all of you take that how you will. But so that, that was in particular what I found to be a, a little bit alarming. Um, when you say to someone that you're gonna take them out of this world, um, to, to, to me, to me, that's, if I was sitting on the other side of that, to me, that's, I take that as a threat of my life. I, I don't know how you two interpret that, but to, to me, that's not, uh, so Dan, well, let me ask Dan, yeah. Dan, the, the, the law would say, would a reasonable person interpret that as a threat? Am I correct in that? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to think back to the statutes and she was just vague enough that I don't think she would have criminal exposure. You know, this world, what is this world? Did she mean political? You know, that would be her defense, right? Well, she you said, know? let me see. I mean, she said, you should be afraid of me. I'm going to take you out of this world. Yeah. Um, this world. Are there, yeah, you said the this world could be, she could say she's referring to the political world. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, there's different ways to interpret that. Right. And keep in mind the, the standard of proof and a criminal trial is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I don't think that would, you know, I, I don't think that would get there. Um, I don't think a prosecutor would, would prosecute it. I, but from to Robin's point, that is concerning, right? Because because just just dealing with being a human being and interpreting something, I I uh, that that was a threat. You know, it felt like a threat to me, uh, even if it didn't rise to uh, a criminality. Um, uh, it was implied just enough. It was it was actually if if her focus if her desire was to kind of get down the middle where she could get the thread in without crossing over into criminality. She did a good job of it. But uh, I, I um, uh, so that that's my take on it, Adam. I hope that answers your question. So yeah, it, it does. It does. And, and I've said in, in 
almost all of the podcasts we've had talking about BLM and their frustration and their anger that they're expressing in public comment. I have a lot of sympathy for them and their anger and their frustration because they have been made so many promises by politicians, especially on this council and, and, and my council as well. When it comes to the 50 points that were passed in 2021, when it comes to police reform um, that, you know, haven't been followed through on, that they haven't gotten updates on, that there hasn't been transparency on, um, you know, when it comes to civilian review board that, that, you know, the feet are being dragged on and, and, and the frustration on things not happening and the lack of action, I totally understand, you know, I get that and I get their anger and I get how inc inc I can understand how incredibly personal and emotional it would be to be in their community and and feel the pain they're feeling and just be led around in circles by the politicians being promising them things but not coming through on them and not getting the information that they're seeking and having to come, up, come to public comment and have to get this angry to get the information they want. That being said, what I'm continuing to also see though, is that when people, other people are coming to public comment and are trying to express anything that strays from exactly the narrative that they're putting forth, they are vicious to those people. They are absolutely vicious. They heckle, they yell, they call them racist. They will not allow their voices to get out and be heard. And so while they are the most adamant defenders of free speech and, you know, are, are so adamant about their free speech being protected and their free speech being heard and their right for free speech and protest, when it comes to other people's right for their speech to be heard at public comment, they have no rights because it's not in line with their perspective, their opinions, and what their message is. And yeah, I just- it, 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 And they snatch microphones. Here. Sorry, it, Adam, it, go. It, 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 it comes into, you know, this is a bigger picture we're seeing play out in our country over decorum in, in civil proceedings. Uh, and what what's what's happened is that the voters of Saratoga elected five Democrats to the city council who are sympathetic to these causes. Um, and, and like you, Robin, you hear some of these stories and, and you are sympathetic for some for people who have skin color different of ours, you know, what they have to go through. You're also you also see the fact that whatever their techniques are doing are effective because it's working right now. They're in front of our city hall. They have people's uh, attention. They have the mayor proposing resolutions on restorative justice. My fear, though, is that where does this at this 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 technique uh, the, the, the problem is when, when, when nothing happens, they're not listened to. When they do this, they're listened to. And whether I agree with it or not, that's just the fact. But now that they have the floor and the attention, our, they're just alienating people at this point. They're not, they're not trying to say, all right, we have your attention now. Uh, and, and the argument would be, well, we've done that before. And then once we you know, take our foot off the accelerator, people stop listening to us. Right. But at some point, at some point, you know, what's the end game here? What are we trying to get at? And how much how much of this will the city tolerate uh, to try to bring equity? And it's it's it's, it's why this, this next election is going to be uh, fascinating, because is this a, a road of the city continues wants to go down or does it want to go down a more law and order road and a decorum road? But and, Go ahead. But I think they should. I think the city should be following through on all the fifty points that were passed with the with the resolution having to do with police reform. Like if they, we, we, I voted on a resolution that passed these points, and we need to follow through on those things. And it shouldn't take people screaming at public comment for that to happen, right? But my problem is, we should also be protecting the rights of people who want to show up and express a differing opinion, and they shouldn't be shouted down because they're expressing a differing opinion. And last night, there was a gentleman who was trying to speak, and I have to say, he sounded incredibly sincere and heartfelt. And his general message was, we're all failing here, and we are, like, none of us are winning in, ter in terms of how we're approaching this, and we all need to just be talking to each other. And at the end, he was trying to invite everyone in the room to a day of prayer on Thursday. And the way he was shouted at, the way he was heckled, the way he was jeered was really just like despicable. And the way the mayor handled it was not to address the audience who, who was treating him so despicably, but to keep telling the man who was speaking to just continue to address the city council, to con continue to address the city council. And I, I just felt that a resident of Saratoga who comes in 
you know, to speak at public comment just shouldn't be treated that way. They just shouldn't. Um, Especially when he's bringing peace to trying to, yeah. you know, if a peace and love is what it sounds like his message was. You guys, we have tons of comments coming in and I just want to throw up a few. Um, one is, can the city council restrict the public comment section of meetings to written comments only? Um, I, I don't know, but I think that I think the public comment, the public comment is in our charter. It's not mandated in open, uh, in open meetings laws, but it is mandated in our charter to have, um, to have a public comment period. I also uh, so, think it would just be like totally pathetic if we can't handle in this small town, like having a public comment period, that's just like under control. Like I, we've managed to do it for all of these years in a way that's like, under control. And so I, I think we should be able to continue to do that in some way, shape or form. So I would hope that it wouldn't be restricted to written comments only because you can email the city council your public comment. But I think it's really, especially when it comes to like, you know, there are controversial issues that come up. And when 15 or 20 people mobilize and come in um, to talk about an issue pertaining to the green belt, to talk about an issue pertaining to their neighborhood or complete streets, or the, the, whole, the homelessness. Let me let me let me talk about that issue because uh, there was there there was a resolution to pass a the a, a, a permanent low barrier homelessness a homeless shelter uh, where code blue is now, which which you, you know seemed it would for the homeless advocates would would it would be, oh that would be great, but one lady got up and this is something we should be talking about. A public comment who's who, who and I don't know her name, but I know she works very closely with our homeless population, said that if we pass this and we make code blue a home, a, 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 a permanent shelter, there'll be 30 beds there. We won't have a code blue shelter now. And last winter in code blue, there were 60 people. So where are we going to put people outside of these 30 next in the next winter? And that, you know, that never came up because the meeting was was hijacked. So, yeah. so and, and, and to answer the question there. Um, there are some people that are eloquent speakers and they're terrible writers and they're intimidated by writing. They won't do it. So you are in effect in quelling free speech if you limit the format, uh, even if it was technically allowed in our charter. I, I don't think the city should do that because um, you, you, you are calling it same same issue that you just mentioned, Robin. Some people's free speech and, and apparently some, some from this movement don't care, as we see. But uh, the city council should not allow that to happen. And they are. They are allowing that to happen. Here's another comment. Um, so if the protesters had been arrested, how would that be wrong? Uh, James, I honestly have no idea because I am not a law enforcement expert. I, I don't think you can arrest people for just protest. I, I honestly yeah. don't know. That's that was like a lot of free speech. That was, that was raucous. But I didn't see a, a snatched microphone. I didn't see an invasion of a barrier. I didn't see some of the physical aspects that I did in previous meetings. I, I don't think there was any criminality there last night that I yeah, saw. Yeah, Dan, Dan is our uh, former law enforcement agent. He's our law enforcement expert. So you, you heard it from the expert there. See, uh, but, but I mean, I think I'm, I, I think the city- I don't know if I'm an expert. Have... I just have some experience in that world. <laughs> the, the city, you can, you can escort people out without, without having them arrested. That you know that that is one option. You could clear the room. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think to say that hey, if people want to come and shut down our city council meetings. That we are powerless to do anything about it. Uh, I, I do believe that that and, and you know the police being the enforcement arm of of society. Uh, you know they very well could have gone in there and and, and arrested people. I, I I I truly believe that. Now is this just going? You know is that is that what the intention was? A lot of times civil disobedience. Uh, is, is you, you know they know the end game is is arrest. Uh, the, the charge would be very minor, uh, and it would be out quickly, if if at all incarcerated. But but uh, the the point is is that I can't in in, in no way is it, it, can we continue on this road. So so you know they 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 got their point across. They have the floor. How what next? How do we move forward in addressing these issues? Right. Here's one more comment. Um, must have been a bargain struck to allow the consent agenda to proceed before this disruption. Uh, Mike A.B., uh, that was kind of what I was alluding to in the beginning of uh, this podcast. I do think the city council was kind of aware that this was going to happen. And I do think my I would surmise 
that they believed if it did break out into a protest that they were going to have to end the meeting. And they understand the importance of passing the consent agenda, which is why they did it before the public comment. But again, that is my pure speculation. Yeah, yeah that means and I agree with you. And I would applaud them for doing that. Yeah. Um, they needed to do that. That was something uh, that they needed to get done and they did it. That, that's, well, that's, the, that's the little bit of a, uh, of uh, positive, I can say about that yeah. last night. The, the, the um, one thing I'll say about that is because, oh, well, let me quickly comment on yeah. that. I, I, and I, I mentioned this to you guys early on in the city council meeting. The public comment, why it was passionate, it was uh, there was decorum. The, 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 there were there weren't as many swear words as as, as the past. But one thing I noticed, uh, and, and is that there were there were young children. And I've thought about bringing my son to city council meetings, and who's twelve, and who, I'm pretty liberal with how I raise him and what he can hear. And I've kind of said, you know what? He's not ready for it yet. There were young children there of, of people involved with our city government. And makes me think there was, I don't know if collusions, I don't necessarily know that there's anything wrong, but it seems like the city council knew what was going to happen, Robin. You, you know, take what, what you said, what you noticed about the consent agenda, what I picked up with, the, with you know, with, there were multiple young children there. Uh, it, it was, it, it, people seemed to know it was going to be a historic night and it certainly lived up to it. I mean, like I said, I knew, you know what I mean? It, it, it seemed like it was a bit of an open secret. Um, Bill wants to know, can they go to two minutes in public comment? We were at two minutes in public comment. Uh, the mayor just changed it to four minutes. Um, it does seem like the four minutes is creating less of an issue with people going over their time. At the same time, it's creating much longer meetings. They did add public comment at the end as well. Um, so it looks like four minutes is... It's kind of here to stay, and we all just have to carve out a lot longer um, in our Tuesday nights if we want to see the full city council meeting. But our viewers don't because yeah. we're there, and we'll break it down for you. Yes, you're right. So, Saratoga, <laughs> we do the hard work for you guys. We, 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 we I've been sacrificing our, you know, every the first and third Tuesday of uh, the month um, for you, Saratoga Springs. We got you. So uh, we will always give you the recap if you do not want to sacrifice the Tuesday, your, your Tuesday night. Um, Thanks for the comments. And folks, if you do go to City Hall meeting and you want to, you want to talk to us, uh, seek us out. There's always well, at least one of us there. Um, and who knows? Maybe we'll make you a cub reporter <laughs> to at least help us get some of the information. <laughs> if you take video, we'll we'll certainly take it and use it. And uh, so please help us out where you can. Guys, I want to um, we actually have a special guest, Commissioner Dylan Moran, coming up in a few minutes and I want to get to him. And I know he actually offered to answer some of these questions, which would be great. Um, but before we do that and continue this conversation, I wanted to quickly update our viewers on one of the um, things that we had talked about last week, was, which was the controversy in the SSFD. Um, so if we could just do a quick update on that. Um, the local 343, which is the Firefighters Union, um, put out a statement last week and held a vote of no confidence, which is what we had discussed in our last podcast. And uh, I don't know if you guys read it or saw it, but boy, did they get slammed for their statement. Um, did did either of you read it? I read the statement. I, I didn't see the slamming online. Well, I I will I can quickly I can quickly read the statement if you guys would like. Would should do you want me to read the statement quickly? Yes, no? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think it's worth it. Um, in what is believed to be an unprecedented action, the Saratoga Springs Professional Firefighters Association has recommended to Commissioner of Public Safety James Montanino the removal and replacement of its fire chief following a vote of no confidence by its entire membership. The anonymous vote was conducted over a period of several days using a secure digital platform following a period of serious consideration and discussion at a special meeting conducted on April 24th. A motion assessing the membership's comfort of critical leadership, a command decision was advanced during the meeting during which all members participated and nearly 90% cast votes of no confidence in removal. More specific, the unusual action stems from firefighters' position that Chief Joseph J. Dolan, a former union president, has in recent years repeatedly failed to act in the interest of safety for the membership and community. In fact, a notion of no confidence vote has been informally discussed since late 2022. Joe Brimhall, president of the Saratoga Springs Professional Firefighters and a 20-year veteran of the department said, our members' concerns are not focused on a single incident and its determination to take this significant step are based on the totality of decisions and actions that we believe are compromising the safety of our community, those who serve it, and our collective confidence in Chief Dolan. The members of Local 34C cite the November 2022 mass shooting during which 11 Saratoga Springs firefighters responded to a chaotic scene where three members of the public suffered gunshot wounds. The responding firefighters were vulnerable to harm 
and experienced significant trauma. The chief's casual actions and concern for the well-being of those under his command eroded a growing lack of confidence in his leadership. Additional factors included a 2021 determination following Chief Dolan's decision to operate apparatuses with only three member crews rather than four, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration's recommendation standard. At the time, the issue was advanced through the chain of command and shared with various city commissioners. Prior to this change, the Saratoga Springs Department was maintained, has maintained four minimum crews as its standard for a period of 32 years. That policy was shaped by the experiences and after action reports stemming from James Way Department store in 1989. I, I don't know what that means. I'm sorry, the James Way Department I, store. I believe some firefighters got hurt in that fire. Okay. In 2019, Chief Dolan proposed an agreement with the town of Greenfield for Saratoga Springs firefighters to provide emergency medical support to the neighboring town. This contractual measure provided EMS support and exposed Saratoga Springs residents to unacceptable risk. Ultimately, it was rejected by the city council in face of significant community opposition. An ongoing series of operational measures impacting patient care needs and emergency response capacity also contributed to the ongoing concerns. These included inner facility transports during which local residents are transferred from Saratoga Hospital to other regional healthcare facilities to planning and preparation associated with the Saratoga race meeting. In both cases, these policies were in conflict with the essential need for concurrent citywide responses during periods of peak uh, demand for emergency services. Local 343 members are grateful for the support of Assistant Chief Aaron Dyer, who for several months has been serving as acting chief. During the period that Assistant Ch Chief Dyer has been in the interim command, there's been a change in culture and morale through the Saratoga Springs Fire Department, Brimhall added. And that concludes their statement. So I would just like to point out that statement's pretty weak. Those examples are pretty weak. And I specifically would like to point out from my own knowledge that when the Saratoga Springs Fire Department showed up to the November 20th mass shooting, this you can hear from the radio calls, the scene was completely secured. Everyone had been arrested, secured. There was no more, there was no security or safety risk that was ongoing. And so, yes, they were treating people for gunshot wounds. And I can understand how that might be traumatic. Um, but mental health counseling was provided after the fact, um, as is, you know, per the policy of the department. And so um, I, I'm, I'm con confounded how that's a reflection on the chief's, uh, like, poor leadership of the chief. I'm completely confounded by that. And to me, if anything... Uh, if anyone's going to be traumatized in that circumstance, I would imagine it would be the police officers who had to run around the corner and were getting shot at. Um, to me, that would be the logical group of people who would probably suffer the most trauma from an event like that. Um, I, I, I'd also just have a hard time. Again, when you read that statement, there's just very little substance to me. And so, um, it, it, Rob, let, let me jump in here. I, I think, and, and you know, I want I want to say that our our our, our firefighters, I, I've there are, I, I've seen the work they've done personally. Um, they've they're saved they're incredible. Two, yeah, two historic buildings. Uh, they're they they've you know they signed the dotted line to rush into fires to rush you know to, to run in while we're all running out. They're 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 great men and women. I think they missed the mark you alluded to with the um, with the mass shooting incident, because in, in my mind, uh, that's what our first responders sign up for. And that's why they deserve all the admiration and support that we can give them is because they are, you know, they are the true heroes who, who, who run, you know, run towards the, you know, there's a move towards the sounds of gunshots. It's, it was in a famous poem. Uh, they are, that's what they're there to do. And, and it's 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 they lost me a little bit with that. My understanding, though, is they believe that the the chief and this will all come out was was essentially uh, comes to him double dipping on on but, company but, time. Did it, hold on. Hold on, Adam. If they think that's what he was doing, why did they not put that in their statement? That, that's not their place to put that in. I, I bumped into Joe Brimhall last week. If I could jump that, in here. That may be true, but I also have to say this has been 10 to 12 weeks of investigation and there's allegedly charges coming, but they still have not come. There have been no charges filed at all. They keep kicking yeah, the can me, down the road. And if someone me, was double- go, it, it, goes, it, goes, it goes into the chaos that is City Hall right now. 
um, but but it, it's it, there's there's just it's the the um, uh, uh, not the policy, but the atmosphere is is one of uh, it's just not a, a one people want to be in and work in, and it causes these yeah. these, these issues. So, uh, I will just that, that, that's that's my take on it. Just you see this with the police department now. I mean, everybody everybody now is being well, attacked or attacking, and it's 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 or fired or lawsuits. Yeah. <laughs> You got Let it. me you jump got in. If, if I could jump in here, uh, I bumped into Joe Grimhall last week, uh, just by chance, and um, I felt the conviction in his voice. And, and to your point, Robin, some of those points, are, you're right, they're not that strong. But the fact remains, 90% of the firefighters gave him a vote of no confidence, and management um, is, is giving him essentially a vote of no confidence. He's getting it from two ends, two separate issues this is a tough thing. We've talked about it with Jim Montanino with the police department um, that, you know, members are leaving. It sounds to me like the fire department has legitimate issues with him. I could sense the conviction in Joe Br Brimhall's voice. He didn't give me specifics at the time because this release was not out yet. But um, there is something there. I, I'm not going to agree that I, there's nothing there. I just have to say none of these issues existed um, from 2020 to um, the, the, the two years that I was in office, none of these issues existed. Um, and we have a ton of brand new firefighters. And I think they're looking to the, the wrong person for leadership. And I think they're getting um, uh, uh, instruction, advice, uh, leadership from the wrong person. Um, but I think that if, if the accusations are making, they would be incredibly easy to prove. And if they were, if they were, if they had any validity to them at all, charges would have been brought a long time ago and they wouldn't continue to kick this down the road. I mean, it, it's been a very long time now. And I just think this whole thing is just, just smells rotten. And I also just would like to point out the PBA put out a statement about this, um, uh, agenda item last night that the mayor had on about restorative justice. They put out an incredibly strong statement it was received quite well on social media. Uh, in comparison, I know this is app apples and oranges, but the firefighters put out this statement. They were eviscerated on social media. 99% uh, of the comments uh, were, were very angry with the union for putting out this statement and in support of the chief. And there's something to be said for how the public receives this. And um, I, I just, again, I think the entire situation is unfortunate, but I wanted to update our viewers because we did talk about it at length um, in our last podcast. Anyway, moving on, moving on. We have a special guest, and it is Commissioner Dylan Moran. Commissioner, are you with us? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Um, I didn't realize your pituitary could uh, generate this much adrenaline, but um, <laughs> it. Uh, I was up till about three last night, just trying to think through everything that yeah. went on. And, um, you know, I just it's been really, listening to, to what you guys, sorry, let me turn you up a little bit. Um, what you guys have been talking about, um, you know, I, I think you're seeing it for what it was. Um, this is a very, very difficult situation. And I appreciate um, the reflection back to your council, Robin, and the reality Commissioner, you're talking about you're not talking about the firemen you're talking about the city council meeting correct so yeah you know, I, okay. I let me just say this about the, the fire fire chief um he deserves every bit of of the judicial system and processes he's entitled to and i do not want to say anything uh, about that situation whatsoever um i think that there is um quite frankly there's a process to work through for them. He has his rights. He has, I believe, filed a grievance. And we need to respect his process. Um, he served our community for, I believe, close to 30 years now, or at least 20. Uh, and, and he deserves his um, day in court. And I, I, I just appreciate would, that would, professionalism. Thank you. Yeah, I would just appreciate, you know, again, everyone kind of looking at it that way. And the men and women in the uh, firefighters union absolutely have their right. And I know... You know, I'm, I happen to be friends with quite a few of them. I know that their decision to have that vote did not come lately. You know, they referenced that it went back a number of, uh, you know, months, um, if not longer. Um, and so, again, um, we're all kind of living on the edge these days. Yeah. I think that I think that all of us walking through life would would do a lot better if we showed grace. 
uh, towards, towards those around us because you really don't know what somebody's going through. And um, whether it's it's personal situations or work situations or stress or, you know, organizationally things aren't going well with, with someone's job. I just think there are so many things weighing on everybody today that we're seeing it manifest itself in a variety of ways. Um, last night's city council meeting being a perfect emblem of that. Um, you know, well the, here's the thing. You said it. You and the, the council members prior to us sat that task force. Those folks worked for months, I believe nine months of their own time. Yep. They, they were cognizant of the community. The police were a part of that process. Um, they diligently worked through issues and they brought forward a set of recommendations that they felt was appropriate and warranted. Those were almost entirely enacted by the city council. I think there were a couple of things that perhaps you deemed maybe needed uh, some more research, which I think was the forfeiture issue. And, um, you know, there were a couple of things where there was questions about what yeah. could or could not be done relative to federal law or, or state law. And that's just the way that it is. And, um, and then, you know, we obviously ran on a platform supporting that and, we get into office. Um, quite frankly, we all had to learn our jobs. I expected Manita to approach the finance office and Ron to approach the mayor's office and Jim to approach his office it, it, in the way that we, um, we promised. And as it related to the 50 points, I talked to Jim on a monthly basis, at least until that stopped, and asked him, what has been done? You need to update the community. It's important that we show progress so we don't have issues. We went over a year where he would refuse to do any such thing. And the reality that we've learned is he hasn't done anything. Um, he had, uh, you know, his mode is to go to the press. He doesn't talk to anybody. He, he doesn't bring legislation before any of us that he wants to pass. He puts it in the press. So I'm not going to work that way. Everything I've passed, I've talked to every single council member about brought their input into it and incorporated it and then passed it five out. And um, I'm can not. I, can I quickly say something about that? Commissioner? Do you know how much sure. that pisses me off so much to hear that? Because we actually did a substantial amount of work to progress those 50 points. And yeah. I had it all worked out in a spreadsheet and, and for him to not carry that, you know, pick up the ball and carry it forward is really so shitty to the police department and all the people that did do the work to carry that forward because the community doesn't know about it. And it just, it, it just makes it look like nothing happened at all. When in fact, exactly. a significant amount of work was done to try to progress the points, you know? Well, what but I would at, what, at, at what point yeah, though- I would just say he's not gonna pay attention to you because you're a woman, Robin. And I mean that. Right. Well, yeah. No, I, I got that kind of like after about 10 minutes of talking to him. So, yeah. Yeah. At, at, at certainly, you know, politicians making promises and not following up on them is not something new here. Uh, <laughs> and like I alluded to before, the, 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 the Saratoga BLM movement certainly has has gotten a place at the table through their tactics. Uh, but at, at what point does it become detrimental to them? And, and trying to achieve their goals. If they, you know, there was a man up there proposing that, that, you know, everybody come to a day, a national day of prayer. And, and, yep. and you were there, obviously you saw, you know, how he was kind of shouted down. Uh, at yep. what point does, does this, does the community or does the council say, all right, we got your message. Now let us work. Uh, is that, is that point, are we at that point now? Or, or is this going to continue? You know, how do you see us moving forward? Well, I think last night was a tipping point. And I think that one, what we have demonstrated and we are not going to back off of, we are going to implement those 50 points, period. I don't care what Jim does here on out, period. He's irrelevant. He's already shown himself to be who he is. The, the slander that he threw at the members of Black Lives Matter last evening was disgusting. And it was it is intended to incite a riot there were a number of police officers in the stairwell to the music hall last evening there were 10 sheriff's cars parked down in the farmer's market and those sheriffs were inside the building 
he was planning for a war and he was throwing kerosene into the fire. Members of the city council and their deputies went and stood in that hallway. We did not allow the police to come through. We talked to them about being used as a tool by a psychopath and everyone came to an agreement. We are not going to do harm to others or put ourselves in a position to do harm and um, or be harmed. Those men and women, basically this is the scenario. Jim has taken the police force, shoved them into a cannon, pointed that cannon at Black Lives Matter, thrown gasoline on them, and he's standing there with a match. Can I just say one thing though, Commissioner? When I hear, like what I heard yesterday about the kind of, like I heard, you know, Skidmore and BLM were planning this civil, this big act of civil, civil disobedience. Yeah. And then I'm hearing that Jim's going to double down on being the law and order guy. I'm, I'm picturing a powder keg. And, and in fairness, I feel like I would want to have police on standby too, just for general, not, not to target any one group, not to arrest any one individual, but just in case some, just for general safety purposes. Because Our biggest concern is not Black Lives Matter. It's, it's, it's other people in the crowd. Right. I'll just offer that. There are people with concealed carry permits that I know are showing up. I, right. And so I, I guess to, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like th there's a rogue element doing here. What he did for who he was. I'm no different. I, I, I need to jump in here. Yes, the, yeah, the, this ahead. podcast has, myself included, has criticized Jim Montanino almost weekly. But Dylan, I, I'm sorry. This It's like you're just so uber focused. Jim, 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 does he not have the right to vote well, the way he wants and to speak on that? Just, I, it well, just feels well, like it's uh, just a, a focused attack on everything Jim does. And again, we've we've criticized him left and right consistently. You're just like uber focused on him. And this is ugly. This just feels what happened ugly. last evening was ugly. And let's take a step back because I think everything really needs to be put into proper focus. So Tyree Nichols was murdered by the Memphis Police Department in February. And rightfully so, it, it horrified me. It horrified every single person that I know to watch that. And I'm telling you, I cannot bear witness to this anymore. I'm tearing up thinking about it. And so the idea that uh, Black Lives Matter might show up and express concern about the fact, here's another black man murdered. What the hell have you done? Why did we stand up for these things? You haven't done anything to put, bring us protection or a modicum of protection. Let's not forget, we are under investigation from the Attorney General's office. That is, that, that is not good. That is not good. No matter what, that is not good. We had we had people who were, who were targeted and followed home after that July 14th thing. Um, lovely people. Alexis Brown, Marcus Fillion are incredibly good people. Marcus Fillion goes to Cornell. Okay. Alexis uh, is, you know, she was going to Arizona State. She's back home. Um, these are educated well-respected people in the community who do not deserve that treatment. But here's the thing. Prior to Tyree Nichols' death, Jim Montanino told Ron Kim he was going to implement this strategy to anything that happened within the context of city council meeting because he needs to appear tough on crime and he doesn't want to get Lee Zeldin, whatever the hell that means. So he has made the political calculation that I'm going to go and do harm to others for my own selfish political and material gains. That disgusts me, disgusts me to no end. Ron said, you can't do that, that's wrong. February 7th happens, we chose to end that meeting. And it's not on videotape because the video got stopped. Jim went on a long racist tirade, throwing every trope possible at those people. That's why we stopped the meeting. So basically you're saying that- And, and then after the fact, Jim goes and does what he said he, he told Ron he wouldn't do. And on top of that, this order of protection that he sought, so everyone understands, this isn't protection for Jim. This was so he could incarcerate Chandler if she, if she acted outward again. The notion that he's attacking a woman of color for speaking to his power is not a shock to me. Look at Laura Emanation. Look no further than her. And so 
We have somebody that is literally using the power of the government to silence speech. You you call him a psychopath earlier? Did I just to clarify? Did you call him a psychopath earlier? Just just so I can clarify. I called him a psychopath last night. I'll call him a psychopath now, and I'll call him a psychopath tomorrow. If I could just ask a question, you mentioned earlier, you kind of put all the blame that there was slow movement on the fifty points on Jim Montanino, but does the whole city council share in some of that? So not not really, honestly. I'm just going to interrupt and say. I just did the assessment role myself because I'm sorry. I just did the assessment role myself because we don't have an assistant assessor presently. We all have the right. We have the responsibility to run our departments. We don't have the right to run somebody else's. It, it really, I will, Dan, I'm going to interrupt and just say the 50 points are really the public safety commissioner's job to implement. They, re, they, they really are. I mean, I was kind of shocked to see the restorative justice one on the mayor's agenda, but the way the, my recollection was the way the resolution read, it was for the public safety commissioner what, to what execute. What about the civilian review board? Wasn't that, that more was for also the for that. That's why I put forward a resolution. I put forward a, pub, uh, a CRB proposal um, at the end of my term because it was my responsibility. That that was how the resolution read. It was the at the end of the day, it was the public safety commissioner's responsibility to execute the 50 points. Um, that the, was the, my the, did, did, I'm, I'm not buying question. some of this attack on Jim. Some of it's warranted, I get. But it just feels like he's trying to be isolated and attacked and ostracized. I can't sure. believe I'm defending the guy, but somebody somebody either. needs to. No, well, he doesn't need defense. He needs to resign. What well, I can see that you're focused. I mean, you called him a psychopath. I, he's going to um, get somebody hurt. I've got a lot of problems with the guy. I do, but this just feels. Uh, well, essentially, what you're saying is that he's guilty of what I'm being investigated for and didn't do. You're saying that he's decided in advance that he's going to target. Black people who are part of Saratoga, Saratoga BLM and arrest them before they've even shown up or committed a crime. He's decided Fact. that he's already going to arrest them. Fact. Yeah. Okay. So Fact. that is, I mean, that's extraordinarily problematic. Really problematic <laughs> that, that the attorney general was meeting with Lex Figueroa scheduled two days after he was arrested. The attorney general had representation in that room last night. Hmm. Yeah. Dylan, let, let me ask, yeah, you. Let me ask this question, and this is for Dan. So, Dan, let's say you were elected commissioner of public safety and your department was under investigation. How many meetings would you have on that topic? Let's say in the first year. Well, I think you've got the answer. I, I don't know how many meetings Jim had. It's more than zero, 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 right? It's more than zero, right? Yeah, he had zero meetings on this. Does not care. I don't know why he's there. I really don't. I don't know what he thinks he's accomplished. It, to me, it's nothing. He's, so he's, the, the, he's, he's the next, the next thing to the ground again. He has he has an opponent who's a Republican. Uh, no, he's and, a Democrat. Uh, well, on the no, Republican that's, line. That's true. That's, that's true. That's true. He's a registered Democrat on the Republican line, ex FBI agent. Um, what it doesn't seem, I would imagine that there is going to be a a solution for this from the public safety standpoint so so i mean what is what is your solution there what would you like to see happen obviously you 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 you're not supporting jim um if the republican says hey listen i support what jim did where does that leave the city council four to one well i i don't mean to answer for commissioner moran but my my what i'm hearing here is that if the city council delivers on the promises of the task force and the 50 points that is what Saratoga BLM's primary focus is, and that will satisfy them, and they will not continue to show up and scream and shout because the progress that they want to see will be happening. Is, exactly. Am I correct? That's 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 the plan. Last night should have been celebratory. I, I for, I for at least I mean that was a significant thing. Whether you agree with it or not, at least for for the Black Lives Matter group and, and and members of the city council, at least four of them, it should have been a very positive meeting. And, and for the most part, it was, um, because you know, again, I, and I, this is a difficult topic for everybody. We know, right? We're talking about religion, race; those types of things are are always sticky under the best of circumstances, right? Your family. Commissioner Rand, so, I don't know why you haven't solved racism yet. I mean, come on, get on it. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it is it is just such a, a difficult thing to for a lot of people to, to, to grasp, right? 
the idea that racism exists, the idea that a system exists that facilitates my personal success as a Caucasian doesn't mean I'm racist. The fact that I benefited from a system that facilitates, um, again, basically, you know, majority power, white people, the, 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 the country was built by white people for white people, right? Um, and I use my life experiences as an example. So um, my mother's side of the family, you know, affluence wasn't the way it was back then. Uh, I, my grandfather was a very famous doctor. He was a war hero. His father was Thomas Edison's best friend, he was the first HR director of, of General Electric. But when my grandfather passed away at the age of 48, he left a, a single wife and three young girls. And they, they moved into out of 16 Fifth Ave, a big, huge, beautiful house, into a small house on this dirt road called Outlook Ave. And they lived in the first house there. On the other side, my father's family fled Ireland and the oppression of the English. Um, we were one of the first families to live in Jefferson Terrace, 12D2. Um, my mom was 19 and, and my dad was 21 when I was born. Um, Commissioner, that's can not, I, that's can not I, an un, unusual circumstance for people living in public housing. And if, if my family came from Uganda and not Ireland, I'm going to tell you right now, my life would be drastically different. Can I, can I make one point, though? Um, and, and, and just let me, like, argue this point for one moment. And I know it's going to sound a little unpopular. But as someone who's not from Saratoga, I have not lived here for generations and generations. And there's a lot of brand new people to the city. Yep. Can you see how, as someone who might be new here, and I'm not talking about myself, but someone who might be new here who has just moved here in the last couple of years, to suddenly be confronted with, okay, I just moved to Saratoga Springs three, four years ago. And now I need to apologize for the history of racism in the city. And I need to feel guilty about the history of racism in the city. I might be like, wait, what? Neither like, of those have to occur. And that's okay, not what I asked myself. Because I think that the way- I understand the language, why it would be interpreted that way. And, and that's, yeah, because I think and that- And bringing it back around, yeah. uh, there's so many things spinning through my head right now. Yeah. That I'm trying to again provide you with with my thoughts and knowledge about the situation. I'm trying to be as deliberate with my words as I can. I know, and I know um, this is really sensitive and complicated. I just and so I think as individuals, where I was going with this was some folk like I've been through 20 years of therapy. Okay, I'm self realized. You want to know why I act so calm at city council meetings? Because you're not going to get me off my game. It's just not going to happen. Um, I've been through some very intense things in my life, professionally and personally, and um, nothing I've seen is going to make me blink in that room. Uh, but there are a lot of people who who don't have that level of introspection, that the, the, the cognizance, the notion that there is a racist issue, some people embody. They, they, they take it personally. They don't grasp the notion that to acknowledge the existence of something does not make you racist. You know, well, it, it I mean, just doesn't. I, and, and I, so what it does do for the members of the community who have these issues on a daily basis, OK, well-known people in our community who are people of color, who have affluence and who are amongst the most generous people in this community have had to deal with this. Right? So I, I also it passed. It, it, it's not economic. It right. is racial. And so. We need to put a base to, to allow that reconciliation to occur. And it's, it's, not, it's not for white people. I it's get that. To acknowledge what has gone on because that's when you can start to heal. You know, I was born in 1970. And growing up, I talked to my parents a lot about what would, because I lived on, in an apartment on North Broadway and we used to walk downtown. And where the city center now was just a wasteland, just destroyed ground. Like I can remember some of the bigger hotels being there that then later got knocked down. But basically it was fundamentally a dirt field with the breadbasket building sitting in there. And I'm like, what was this? What happened? And, and, and they told me they knocked down a neighborhood. And then as I got older and I asked questions about Vietnam War March and Civil Rights March, my parents were like, there were Vietnam War marches, but there was no Civil Rights Marches. And I was like, why? They're like, because they knocked down all their homes and forced them out of the community about 10 years before. Who does that? I think that when I was commissioner, I passed a resolution that acknowledged the systemic racism that we have in our institutions, specifically in the city. 
And I, and I truly believe that, you know, our country has systemic racism built into all of its institutions. And we have that here in Saratoga Springs. I think that the thing that caught me off guard with the resolution last night was that the language of it was worded in a way that seemed deeply personal somehow. And I think that there was a way to introduce that and bring kind of the different groups to the table and introduce that in a way that would have I agree. Had the intended effect in a way that would have been more effective in bringing people together versus kind of creating more controversy. And I, and I, and well, I don't yeah. know how you could have done what we did last evening and not create controversy. Um, as you said, the intent of that, you know, um, of that edict was actually yeah. for the police department to perform that. And they're yeah. not going to. Well, also, let me, me, let, well, let, let me let me jump in here real quick. Agenda uh, um, forward in a way that maybe didn't focus the light so much on one particular group, but rather was cognizant of, of the totality of, of our community. Wait, because follow up. Black, no, hold on, hold black on, Robert, one of our economy is built on black and brown people. That's with it. All, with, with with all that being said, uh, at what point we saw a young lady go there and seem to offer a threat to Commissioner. Uh, Montanino. At what point yeah. does does the 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 it does it you know is this a blanket ticket to to shut down every city hall meeting? No, at, I mean, at what point does this get go go too far in trying to achieve the goal? Last evening, and I believe that might have been like one of the last commenters. That was beyond inappropriate. And um, but I think what happens is is if you continue to create these scenarios where conflict is so ripe and so raw. You're going to get that. And then what happens to the response to that comment next time? And then what happens to the response to that comment next time after that? That's where the concern resides. Yeah. Jim Montanino has a responsibility to de-escalate. We talk about the, you know, what we want to see out of our police departments these days in terms of facing these situations is that de-escalation is generally one of the things that we're, we're looking to see happen more, right? Again, without sort of assessing public safety in the right way to approach a, a position, I'm just speaking rhetorically. Um, Jim is doing the exact opposite. He's intentionally I mean, and purposely, he blamed Black Lives Matter for destroying the Civil the civil War statute. He said oh, that. I think, I think they didn't blame me for that as well, which I thought was kind of actually just humorous. But, I, I mean, feel like the mayor that we also had the mayor jump out of his seat and charge Commissioner Montanino. And I really thought that Mayor Kim was going to like punch Jim in the face. So, I mean, hey, we're not making that to me. I didn't see that myself, but it was really hard to hear each other. Yeah. Um, he, he I did. Think saw the movement though, right? Yeah, really? you, saw, you saw the mayor get up and approach him, right? I thought they were talking. I, I honestly. He was, he, so Ron like actually jumped up and said, right? something. Yeah, I don't so know. I, I, his back was to me, so. My point, my point is that Mayor Kim is not leading by example, in my opinion, either, you know? Um, I think this so, is very frustrating for everybody. And, it is and, very frustrating and, for everyone. You know, again, let, let's be honest. We, we're in the crucible of a, of, a, of a primary. There's nothing really more sort of difficult than navigating a primary. Um, you know, I, as an officer of the party, I've been talking for years about the importance of finding a way to be able to facilitate you know, primaries without hostility mm. because of what we went through uh, with Commissioner Madigan um, and the primary that that she lost. Um, it did a lot of damage to the party itself that I've been working for the last several years to, to try and rebuild. And, you know, if the demographics continue to move the way they do, we're going to become Albany from a certain extent, you know, from the um, sort of the political uh, process standpoint. And so we need to be able to lead and demonstrate leadership through effective processes that, you know, don't harm or don't create this conflict, right? Let's facilitate a proper conversation and, and do so respectfully. It, you know, I'm not going to blame Trump, but I'm going to blame Trump. Uh, this the political environment is just horrific these days. I mean, the things that I get attacked on, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I can confidently say I did every single thing that I said I would do in office. And I did it in the first year. Okay. And yet I'm still getting attacked for, I mean, the paper, just straight up lies, the, the newspaper. Okay? I wish Prime so. Unit has printed repeated articles that are factually incorrect. So they're either friggin' lazy or they're intentionally biased. Well, I think Adam and I can fully relate to that. But I will just say this one thing. I wish I would implore all of you on the council though, to speak more respectfully to each other, because I do think sometimes the level of discussion amongst the city council members 
really goes downhill sometimes. And, and what happens behind the scenes. I can't even imagine. And I think it's a poor reflection of the group. And I think it gives people license to act even worse in public comment when they see city leadership treating each other in a really shitty, disrespectful manner. And so I would just implore you guys to raise the level of discourse amongst yourselves. I appreciate um, that. And, and I, 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 take I know that. it's difficult. I got, I got heated last night and um, in a way that I hadn't before, but I had to say something. Well, listen, I, I know we've kept you here for, it's been a long time. We, we actually brought you on today to talk about short-term rentals and outdoor dining. I'm wondering if you want to come I'm back. Have and, issues. Can you come back next week and talk about those two things? Cause I, they're really important. And, but we've been, we've been uh, live streaming for quite some time now. And I really want to yeah. give both of those issues like a proper amount of time. Could yeah, you join I, us again you, next week? I can try to, um, look at the calendar. I, I have a guy coming into town. I'm not sure when for work. It's a maybe, but let me let me just give you, do me a favor and, and pop up the picture. I just wanted to yeah, give you guys yeah. a little understanding about what's going on. First off, you had a gentleman on. Who this seemed, one? Yeah, who seems very, very, uh, actually the other one. Okay, wait, hold on one sec. And hold on, let me get rid of wait, that. Give me, give me the past one. I'm sorry. It, it, oh. it, they're, 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 they're actually a copy of three. So. Uh, the gentleman you had, who, again, seems much more interested in, in expressing his bias than facts, has continued to make incredibly false statements about the process by which um, facilitated outdoor dining to begin with, which was a, 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 a edict from the executive office that uh, Robin and the rest of the, you know, the council at that time stood up in a, in a very ad hoc way. And you know that there wasn't any laws around it. There, you were just doing what you're trying to do to help the businesses at that point in time. Um, what I did is I took the work that you did, built on it, um, and brought formality to it so that it was a legitimate legal process. In addition to that, uh, Commissioner Scirocco and I worked together on this. Um, he wanted to ensure that it was is zero burden on the taxpayer and that it would be uh, facilitated through costs borne by the businesses. And we are staying absolutely true to that. Um, second off, there are multiple public hearings over this law and Sorry. the committee that he says doesn't exist is literally written out in the law. I don't approve these things. They, there's a process where people from every single department weigh in, including code enforcement, and then they approve the permit. It goes on a resolution. It goes into the consent agenda because it's ministerial at that point. It's not like, I'm not some czar. It's, it's kind of comical that he's saying that. Do I own that? Yeah, I own dog licenses too. It doesn't make me the dog czar. Um, but God, I kind of wish someone up, called me the czar of something. I wouldn't mind being a czar. So yeah, question, yeah. when, when did so the- So what we've got here is, is, the, is the improvement that we wanted to make this year, which was we're trying to bring this to, to more of a permanent state. So the waste blocks that were used, they're waste concrete blocks, they're inexpensive. They look like crap, right? Everyone can agree with that. It doesn't fit the, the tone or tenor of historic downtown Saratoga. So I made a change to the law at the end of last year. Um, every single business that's doing outdoor dining now has to go before the design review board to get approval for uh, look, feel, appearance, right? That, that kind of subjective element. So there's consistency. And then I went to work on trying to drive uh, a, a very high-end look for the enclosures for those businesses. We worked with Fort Miller, which is a cast concrete company. We actually bid this out, but Fort Miller was the winning bidder. As you can see, we're going to have two separate elements here. We're going to have barriers, and we're going to have planters. Um, the barrier, if you look at it from the end section, kind of looks like a fluted railing almost. You can kind of see that shape. Um, it's going to have a much more elegant look to it. And then the, the planters themselves, are going to have natural live plants growing out of them. So if you flip to the other one, Robin, I can show you very quickly. Real quick, who pays for those? That is being, so this is very interesting. This is a, um, uh, a private public partnership. And why I say that is um, Supervisor Matt Veach was able to garner uh, $14,500 in a grant to, um, uh, to the city uh, from an economic development account. Um, and so the first order for these was placed by the city. Um, we're going to spend $14,500, get remunerated from the county. Matt then got another $18,000 from the discretionary fund that they were provided. Um, the total cost for this is roughly $90,000. So we, we were able to chop out about 35% of the cost 
after that, the cost is being borne by the businesses. And uh, we've actually set up a partnership between the Chamber of Commerce, Adirondack Trust Company, and the businesses, whereby they can either buy them right up front, which some of them are doing, or they can finance them over a couple of years' time. Um, as oh, you can imagine, okay. the, the barrier set going down Henry Street is pretty expensive. And yeah. they're opening a new business at this time as well. Um, and so, you know, to be able to defray the cost a little bit, um, Mr. Waite at the at the bank was more than willing to do so um, uh, for these businesses because he gets it. I get it. You know, my life and growing up, it, people used to work their butts off in the summertime to barely make it through the winter. Is there, the still a, scenario going. is there I know there was a question about the fee or the fee schedule associated to that they pay the yeah. city for so the outdoor dining forward, yeah, so going forward, I just got the number the other day now that we have. So what you, if you scroll up, you can see what I've provided you is the layouts for all the streets and how those are going to be done. We had to get that in place. Uh, Joe O'Neill then went through and determined what the costs were going to be for the department. And I'm, I'm basically establishing that cost as a lineal foot fee. So if mm. your if your layout is 50 feet long, it's this price. If it's, if it's gotcha. 150 feet long, it's that price. Um, that seemed to be the fairest way. And and the way this is working out, the businesses themselves are paying roughly $7,500 to $8,000 for those enclosures um, for the barrier set. Um, and again, that varies, you know, again, the, the one going in front of kindred is, is the biggest or the longest, if you will. And um, the, uh, you know, What's so kindred? again, I'm sorry. Kindred, so Flatbread Social. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was a new name. So, Sorry. Yeah, it's a new name. It's going to be an organic wine and tapas type business. Uh, oh, my God. That's amazing. Good. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, if you look at our market from a business standpoint, we're saturated with, you know, bars and restaurants, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of them wind up being derivative. Sports yeah. bar this, trivia that. You know, I got totally. all the things. Italian uh, this. Yeah. yeah, we don't have enough Italian restaurants, do we? You know, we don't we don't allow food trucks, but one of the people who's talked to me about finding a way to use them is Brendan Dillon at Hamlet and Ghost. And I was really surprised that he came forward with that. You know, I used to work for his dad. Um, you know, the, the, the restaurant industry, the, 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 the cost is so prohibitive to enter our market and then it's hyper competitive. His position yeah. was is that's why you wind up with seven Italian restaurants because nobody's yeah. willing to take a chance. Whereas if you have a um a, a food truck rodeo or something like that. You can introduce new cuisine. You can test out things. Oh. And then ultimately those people can advance from a food truck into a restaurant. I'm still not sold on the idea because again, probably be a riot. Um, but um, you know, he's a very deep thinker on that. And I think it's, it's a great point. The city, <clears throat> you know, again, it just doesn't allow food trucks on, on, on um, city property. It's got to be a private property, but uh, I'm digressing. Um, the, um, the other thing to mention, these are all going to be dark green. Oh, and they, nice. And they're going to have an anti-graffiti uh, coating on them. So these are built for the long term. They're going to be continuous or rather consistent in their look. Uh, I'm already getting calls from businesses who've caught wind of this. And there's definitely some FOMO going on. And my attitude is anybody who wants to try doing this, we're going to help too. Because it is something that, one, I think really drives very, very interesting streetscape. Um, you know, I, I, I'm of European descent, like most folks. Um, you see how they live their lives over there. And if, if we don't know that we can learn a couple things about how to live our lives from Europe, we're not paying attention because they live longer, they're happier. Um, you look at the, the way that they, you know, enjoy life, dining, you know, social Watch. aspects. I just about to be to the best. I yeah, hate roundabouts. Yeah, I'm not crazy about it myself. I know, but once you get used to them, it's much better than a stoplight. I, I still can't drive yeah. through them. I suck at them. Wait, Commissioner, real quick. I know there was some question as to when outdoor dining um, was going to start, and I just can't remember where that ended up, that conversation. So what we did at the beginning of, of the outdoor dining season was we just saw the way the calendar was falling. Mm -hmm. And to set up the sidewalk cafes, the opening, they would have had to start setting them up on a Saturday and they couldn't find contractors. And all I did was pull that forward a couple of days so they could set it up and get that first weekend. Um, and I think what we're going to do is change the law so that could be set by resolution every year. So you're, you're just maximizing the time um, for the businesses. And again, this is all 
sidewalk kind cafes have them. been in place for 25 years and I haven't heard that individual complain about them in 25 years. So I don't really understand the problem with outdoor dining and, and facilitating more business and the revenue associated with it. Um, I mean, isn't that kind of how we structure it on the other end? Like we have kind of like a sunset date on the other end that we can kind exactly. of like, yep. yeah. Okay. Okay. We would, we would set those based on the calendar on an annual basis. I, would I applaud your work on outdoor dining. Uh, you, you were right out of the box. You right out of the gate. You were on that and uh, you've been very forward thinking on that. Well, I appreciate have that. You... I, mean, I want to go a lot further. I, I would love nothing better than the gut to be church street in Burlington. I now really I got a little a lot of potential there. When I was doing this, I got some pushback from some of the businesses that were surrounding these restaurants about losing their parking spaces. Mm -hmm. um, have you, has that continued? Have you gotten any negative feedback about the parking spaces that are being lost because of, you know, the businesses that use them that aren't necessarily the restaurants, but are, you know, on the second floor or a restaurant or our businesses that aren't, uh, you know, brick and mortar first floor customer facing? Um, you know, I think coming out of the the pandemic there are a lot of people that were concerned for their businesses and rightfully so and i yeah. and i think that you know seeing a, a hand being lent to one industry and maybe not the other perhaps caused some some bitterness yeah. i call it business on business crime um i'm yeah. not a supporter of that i believe <laughs> if, if people are are coming to to eat they're going to shop and if they come to shop they're going to eat and here's the thing Nobody was eating inside during COVID. People could put a mask on and go in and shop. They could shop online. I can't eat online. So each each sort of scenario dictates its own, you know, sort of response. Uh, if we're trying to do what I'm trying to do, which is support our business community, you, you take out equine sports, and our 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 legacy, our identity is is small owned chef owned restaurants, right? Small boutiques owned by the owner that are unique. This is not an outdoor mall, right? We're not Clifton Park. There's something very very unique and special about us. If we got out of the if we got out of the the, the, the pandemic and three businesses are surviving, what good is that, right? We need all of them, and somehow we made it through that by losing three businesses, which is insane. I, yeah. I credit the Chamber of Commerce. I can. I, I credit the federal government and the programs that they put in place. You credit me. You credit me. Listen, you guys did a good job. You stepped forward. You know, again, yeah. you know it's not easy to get five people to agree on anything. Hey, it was brutal. And, and I also have to credit this community was so compliant with the COVID restrictions that were in place. And so people didn't get fined. They didn't lose their licenses. They they followed the rules because they knew they had to for whether it was health reasons or because it was because they knew they couldn't lose their liquor license or their, you know, their business license. It, and I was so just impressed by how this community responded to COVID. And I'm eternally grateful for that. I think the way that the community has responded to a lot of things is, is pretty incredible. And, you know, yeah. bringing it back around to, to the subject that we touched on. Yeah. We're going to need them to be resilient again. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to do everything in my power to help this plane land softly. Um, we do not want people marching in the streets. They did that work. Yeah. The work now needs to be done internal to City Hall. It needs to be done in a way that's respectful of, of, of men and women in the police department. And one of the conversations that, that I just had this morning, with Commissioner Golub, is that there really hasn't been a lot of engagement with the police on these issues. That's from, the, so from the, you know, well, you know, obviously the chief was was on the um, was on the the task force. He voted in favor of a lot of these items, but the rank and file. So, like, I have the downtown advisory committee, and I've been working with. Lieutenant McIntosh, now Lieutenant McGovern, and Lieutenant Mitchell. They're great, great people. Nothing but the best intentions with the work that they're doing. And, you know, they deserve a voice. They, they you know, they it's ought like to weigh it. in as well. Because, you know, nobody can have something implemented on them and it's going to happen. People have to accept it and, and, and buy in. Well, or, I think... Like, the, the thing that we did last night, that people could get that upset about words, is startling to me. Because... Frankly, I want you to understand the words. I want you to think about them. Nobody's pointing a finger at you. Nobody's calling you racist. What we're acknowledging is the facts of the world. Um, well, the problem was, though, last night, everybody was calling the police department racist. You know well, what I mean? Well, listen, that's, that's another thing entirely. And, and I know. I but that, I, think so I think as we get further into this, I think that BLM will start to understand 
that the police are not going anywhere. They're a part of society. I, I personally believe government exists for, for primarily public safety. And, and as such, there are bad people in the world. And but I so, mean, at a minimum, we need people for crowd control. So, but my, but but, my point is, I think, it, I think it's really incumbent on you guys as a council to then go back and really engage with the police department. Absolutely. And, and, and because as Commissioner Golub, I think, would be the first to say, unless you have buy-in from the police department on any of these issues, you will fail in your endeavors. I mean, I think that's exactly what he said earlier, Robin. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we're pretty like-minded. He, he and I are, you know, we went through it really uh, together um, in lockstep when it came to the task force and, and in creating the 50 points. And, and I was right there with them as they went through those nine months of work. And so, um, and so we're pretty like-minded in a lot of these things. So um, he's a good man. He really is. I, he's I, a great I, guy. So and and we only want to see all of these things succeed for, for everybody in the community. So anyway, um, I know that um, these guys have to log off. I've got a, a two o'clock call I've got to prep for, and we've kept you for so long. But Commissioner Moran, I just want to thank you because these were some really challenging topics that we talked about today. And I just appreciate your willingness to go there with us and, yeah. and discuss them. Um, I deeply appreciate it. And Dan and Adam, do you guys have any final thoughts for Commissioner Moran? Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate this long night for you last night. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, uh, Commissioner. You know, and you know, thank you for showing up to work every day to make that thirty bucks a day or ten bucks a day. Or whatever. I'm down to eight cents an hour, guys. So um, <laughs> making but, the big know, bucks, I, baby. I appreciate what you're doing because you know. You're, this is something that actually I wanted to mention because Robin said this. I can't remember one of your podcasts. We absolutely can do a better job communicating. I, for one, struggle to try and understand where to go because you hit every channel. Yeah. You, know, you hit all the papers, you hit social media, you're on the website, but somehow that's not enough. I know. And so I appreciate what you're doing. You're, you're providing me an opportunity for my own expression. I'm answering questions in a truthful manner. Um, that's how I operate. Uh, you will never hear a lie out of me. You may not like what I have to say, but I, I, I'm an honest person. That's how I run. And, you know, my life is way too busy to remember what I said to this person and what I said to that person. I got one truth and, and it served me well to get this far in life. And I'm not going to stop being that way. Um, and I, I deeply value the, um, the opportunity to serve this community. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And I hope we have you back soon. Yeah, um, I'll let you know about next week. Awesome. Thank you so much, Commissioner Moran. Much appreciated. We will speak to you soon. Be well. Bye. All right, kids, we want to wrap up with some quick cheers and jeers. We have so many comments, but I don't think we have time to. Uh, I know, I know, to address them all. Hey, real quick, before yeah. I, I'm going to I'm gonna forego my cheer and jeer, but I think it's important that I throw this oh, in there. Yes. Uh, Saratoga Flash News, the local blog spot, is actually reporting on a response from Commissioner Montanino that I think oh, it's important okay. that we read. Do so, read um, yep. So uh, this is this is Commissioner Montanino today. Wait, We're is responding this for real? To is this kind of a, usually it's like a spoof Site is this a real response? I believe this. No, is Flash News. That's that. That's Rob Millis. That, that's not spoof. Well, it's usually <laughs> parody. Right? Yeah, he yeah he uses. Yeah, okay, yeah he's, he's got a sense of humor, but he's at times serious. Anyway, okay. So this is what he says. Um, uh, he's he, they, they, the the Flash News reached out to him, and this is his complete unedited text. Uh, Jim Montanino said, "My point was simple: hundreds of years of Anglo-American jurisprudence and thousands of years of Judeo-Christian ethics have rejected the notion of collective guilt." There is thus no valid reason for Saratoga Springs as an entity to be portrayed as a racist city by the people elected as its leaders. Moreover, the very apology that the mayor advanced in his resolution had been considered and rejected by the previous council, with nonetheless accept, which nonetheless accepted 50 points of police reform. I attempted to make the historical reference to the 77th New York Volunteer Regiment, which mustered out of Saratoga County during the Civil War and joined the Union Army to fight the scourge of slavery. This fact stands in stark contrast to the claim that Saratoga Springs is and was a racist city. While there were draft knots, draft riots in New York City, up here in Saratoga, men were willingly lining up to volunteer and risk their lives for the Union cause. We dishonor the memory of those soldiers with the apology resolution. I pointed out that the statue in Congress Park, erected by the veterans of the 77th at their own expense, was toppled in July 2020 after it stood peacefully for a century and a half. The mayor believes that he can buy peace with BLM through appeasement. I have come to the conclusion that BLM is not interested in peace, 
but wants chaos instead. When I ran in 2021, I emphasized two points. First, that the city needed a civilian review board. Second, that I would provide a detailed written report on the death of Daryl Mount. I fulfilled both of those promises. The Mount report was issued in my second month in office. The CRB ordinance, which I drafted myself, was presented to the city council in my fourth month in office and passed unanimously in, in my fifth. The response from BLM, they are still falsely accusing Saratoga Springs police of murder, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, and they don't even attend the inaugural meeting of the CRB. The ineluctable in, in conclusion to be drawn from these facts is that BLM is not interested in reform, but aims only to sow division, discord, and discontent. I fear that the mayor and other city council will soon double down on their mission of appeasement. The no knock warrant resolution and the apology resolution are only the beginning. I shudder to think about what is yet to come. Some strong wow. words. And yeah. this was written in response to, is this from last night or is this from, he wrote this during watching? No, no, I, from, from everything I'm reading, uh, um, Bob Mills, if you're watching, chime in here. But uh, everything I'm reading is that this was in response to what happened last night. And, and it goes back to what Commissioner Moran was saying of just of just getting an outlet for, for the, the, you know, the, the, the day of the local newspaper is gone. We have multiple outlets now, uh, and and so this is, I think, his 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 trying to get his word in about what happened last night. And and with that being said, uh, certainly we would love to have him on the show and and, and talk about the 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 his you know his his viewpoint of, of what happened and what's what's going on, and uh, just like we did Commissioner Moran. So we, we anyway, I, I, him to give him an opportunity I did, invite, to, I did invite know. him on. I did extend that invitation, just so you guys know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Anyway, so I'll forgo my cheers and jeers. It was. Yeah, this was, seems like some heavy yeah. shit, to, not to use an expletive, but it's heavy shit today. So cheers and jeers seems kind of out of place for the moment. Yeah. Um, Man. Well, I guess we'll pick up here next week, you guys. And to everyone who commented, I'm sorry we didn't get to it, you all. It's been an hour and a half, um, which is way long for us. And so we appreciate all the comments. I'll try to respond to some um, if we can uh, later online. Um, but we appreciate where can everybody people who see the comments, Robin. Where can they see to your Facebook page? Where where oh, are that's, these? That's the thing. I'm seeing we we live stream on so many different social platforms. You and get the I'm aggregated them, comment. Yeah, I see them all in one spot. So some of these are on YouTube. Some of these are on Facebook. Um, it's kind of half and half. Some on YouTube. Okay. Some on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but we had a ton of people uh, watching the live stream today. So we appreciate everybody watching. You can all find us on everywhere you watch podcasts. Um, subscribe, like, share. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan and Adam. Thank you to Commissioner Moran for coming on. And we will see you all next Wednesday. Thanks, folks, for yep. watching. All right, Bye, guys. Thank you very much.